Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Sarah Panik, and I'm an Education USA advisor here at the Fulbright Commission. In today's webinar, we are going to be doing an overview of choosing, funding, and applying for US study at the postgraduate level. And at the end, we'll have time for a Q&A. So I will ask that you hold any questions until the end. It might very well be that I answer your questions as we go. Uh, so if a question does come into your mind, feel free to jot it down, make a note of it. And at the end, I'll have you put those questions in the Q&A box. I also want to let you know that this session is being recorded and I will be sharing a link to the recording with everybody who is registered. And so don't feel like you have to memorize everything that I'm saying or write everything down as I'm saying it, or if for some reason your internet connection drops off or you have to, to leave early, um, know that you will be sent the link to that recording uh, in the coming days. Uh, and just to tell you a little bit more about myself, as I said, my name is Sarah, and as you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm not originally from the UK. I am from Chicago in the US, where I completed both my undergraduate and graduate degree. And I have been living in London now for the past seven years and working at Fulbright for the past five years. And I'm delighted to be here this evening presenting this webinar. So without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So just to tell you a little bit more about who we are and the services that we offer. So I work at the US-UK Fulbright Commission, which was established more than 70 years ago in the aftermath of World War II by a man named Senator Fulbright. And Senator Fulbright himself studied in the UK as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. And he thought that the best way to promote peace would be to encourage cultural and educational exchange. And so we were born from that. And we are a non-for-profit organization that's jointly funded by the US and the UK government to promote peace and cultural understanding through educational and exchange. And we do that in a number of different ways. So one way that we do that is by offering scholarships for postgraduate study and research in both the US and the UK. And then another way that we do that is by offering an advisory service to assist students, parents, and advisors with applying for US universities. And the advisory service is part of the Education USA Network which is a US Department of State network of over 400 international student advising centers throughout the world. And our aim as Education USA advisors is to offer free and unbiased advice to help UK students study in the US. And we're actually the only official source of US study here in the UK. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about why students choose to go to the US for their studies, because there are thousands of students that go from the UK to the US each year. And in particular, these are some of the reasons why students choose to go at the postgraduate level to the US. So as you can see here, there is a wide range of choices available. So there are over 1,700 universities that offer postgraduate degrees in the US, compared to about 120 here in the UK. So with that number of institutions, there's a lot of a variety amongst the institutions and also amongst the academic departments. So just a lot of choice on offer. Going to the US also offers the opportunity to internationalize your CV. As you might imagine, employers cite cross-cultural experience as an attractive quality. And it's also helpful to have diverse experiences and to demonstrate the independence that's necessary to study abroad. Going to the US also offers global networking opportunities. Uh, it, it offers an unparalleled opportunity to create global networks, not only with American faculty and institutions, but also with the diverse colleagues that make up many U.S. universities. Also, U.S. universities offer practical experience. There are so many opportunities for hands-on research, internships, and teaching opportunities in the U.S. You also have the opportunity to expand your horizons. It, living and studying in another country expands your worldview and also expands the opportunities that are available to you in the future. And though it might be surprising to some of you, uh, a final top reason to study in the US is the funding opportunities. There are a lot of funding schemes and scholarships available at the postgraduate level, which we'll talk about in much more detail later on. And I'd also like to discuss some of the key differences between a US and a UK postgraduate degree. So in the US, we typically have longer programs. So master's degrees are typically two years, although there are some one year programs out there. And PhD programs are typically four to six years, although this may be more or less depending on the program or the department. 
a PhD includes an, an, a master's that's integrated into it. So what that means is that when you're doing your PhD, you're going to have coursework for the first year or two. Um, and this is even if you already have a master's. If you're going for your PhD in the US, you, you will be doing this, this coursework for the first couple of years. So if you do already have your master's, you can still use that time to sharpen your skills, gain more experience teaching or doing research um, as an assistant, for instance. It's typically not an optional component of the degree. There, aren't, there isn't really such a thing as any, a pure research degree. Um, programs just include co coursework at the postgraduate level. Something else to keep in mind in the US is that there's no set fees or standard application deadlines. So there's a lot of variance by university and by department. And also in the US, postgraduate programs are organized by the departments um, as opposed to by your supervisor. You won't necessarily know who your supervisor is beforehand. And especially some programs are more interdisciplinary, which means that you may have multiple supervisors or a committee. Um, and you also don't necessarily need to have an in-depth research proposal when applying to a program. They often expect you to figure that out throughout the program. And then a final thing to be aware of is that both law and medicine are studied at the postgraduate level in the US. And to give you an idea of the timeline, um, this is a really good time for you to be attending this webinar if you're looking to start your studies in autumn of 2023, because we typically recommend beginning to research programs about 12 to 18 months before you hope to enroll. And then about 10 to 12 months before you hope to enroll, you'll be finalizing the selection of where you want to apply. And around that same time, you might be taking any required admissions exams and beginning your applications. And we'll talk more about the admissions exams and the applications later on in the presentation. Then about eight to 10 months before you plan to enroll, you'll put together that application and you'll submit it according to the deadlines of the institutions. And then about four to seven months before enrollment, you can expect to hear back from the universities that you applied to with their admissions decisions. And then based off of where you were accepted, you'll notify universities of your decision and you'll apply for your visa about one to three months before enrollment. And then you'll kind of gather all the information that you need um, to, to think about before departing to another country. We have lots of pre-departure resources available on our website that you can check out, thinking about travel advice, living arrangements, campus life, that type of thing. And then you'll typically start your studies around mid-August to early September, which is you might know is slightly earlier than you would in the UK. And now I'd like to talk about choosing a program, because as I said earlier, there's over 1,700 institutions offering postgraduate programs. So that's a lot of options and each institution and department will be different. So how exactly do you go about narrowing down where you want to actually apply? And a term that we focus on a lot at the Fulbright Commission is this idea of fit. What this means is that we want for students to find a program that's really going to be the best fit for them and for their personal and academic interests. So the first step in this choosing process is figuring out what factors are important to you. And this means that you're not just looking at universities that you've heard of straight away or ones that you've seen mentioned in movies or television programs or even ones that have the highest rankings, but really thinking through some different factors that are going to be important to you and making sure that you're finding the best institution for you. So some of those different factors that you may wish to consider are up here on the screen. One of them is the types of institutions. And we go into more, much more detail about the different types of institutions um, that are available on our website. But for instance, you might be trying to decide if you want a public university or a private university. Public universities tend to be much larger and have a lot more options available. Um, private universities tend to, have to, be, to be smaller um, and maybe don't have as many uh, options on hand, uh, but this can vary. So, you know, but just things to think about. You might also think about the program type, which at the postgraduate level is arguably more important than the institution itself. You'll be thinking about things like your career goals, qualifications, any concentrations you might be interested in. You might be looking for a program with funded internship opportunities. Maybe you're looking for programs where you can get grant writing experience. So starting to think through some of those things. And then you'll also think about the academic department because choosing the right department is almost as important as choosing the right university at postgraduate level, since it's going to influence so much of your experience in the US. At the postgraduate level in the US, academic departments generally handle admissions, they design the course structure for students, 
They monitor a student's progression through the program. And so it's essential to research the department to make sure that you're finding the right academic home for you. And departments can vary drastically in areas of faculty expertise, the different types of elective courses or concentrations that they offer, whether they're tightly focused or they're more interdisciplinary. Um, they can vary in terms of their size and their atmosphere. And they also vary in the different opportunities for teaching or research, conference attendance, internships, et cetera. So all of these are things that you could be thinking about and incorporating into your research. And then of course, location. You, the US is a massive country. It spans six different geographic zones. So you'll be thinking about, are you hoping to be in a more urban or a more rural environment? You might be thinking about climate. If you're somebody who hates the cold and you hate it being dark all winter long, you're probably gonna be avoiding the Northeast or the Northern parts of the US. Or, or if you're somebody who you know, doesn't want it to be hot year, year round, you're not gonna be looking too much in, at the South. Um, so thinking about that kind of thing. You might also be thinking about access to transportation options. Uh, are, you, are you going to be at a university that would require you to have a car or at a university that, that you know, what, what types of public transportation is available if you're not going to have a car? Thinking of the, about that. You can also think about if there's anywhere that's a particular center of excellence in your field. So for instance, if you're really interested in political science, maybe you're looking at Washington, DC, or if you're really passionate about finance, perhaps you're looking at New York, just for examples. And then also extracurricular opportunities. If there is something that you like to do outside of your time in the classroom that you're particularly passionate about and you're hoping to kind of maintain that extracurricular in the US, you'll want to make sure that it's something that's available in the place that you are going to. And then lastly, finances. So we'll talk about this in more depth uh, later in the webinar, but if funding is important to you, um, funding your studies, then this needs to be part of your choosing process right from the beginning. Oftentimes funding, especially funding that comes from universities, is awarded and applied for alongside the application process. So you don't only just want to start thinking about it after you've applied and been accepted, because at that point it might already be too late and we wouldn't want for you to be disappointed later down the line. So as I said, we'll talk about this in more detail, um, but we always say follow the money, and so if you need funny funding to pursue postgraduate study in the US, you'll be sure to look for these opportunities from the very start. So with that in mind, and with so many different factors to consider, how might you go about narrowing down your options? And on our website, we have a page all about choosing a university, which includes a list of links to helpful search engines, um, such as Peterson's or gradschools.com. You might also use previous professors to see whether they have any advice or opinions on schools that could be a good fit for you, or maybe professionals or colleagues that work in your fields that have an idea of schools that are in your discipline. You could also think through the work of scholars that you've previously read. Uh, is there anyone that you've identified as doing the kind of research that you'd like to do? Where are they teaching? What are their colleagues working on? And you'll want to narrow down your choice of universities to about 10 or so institutions to do further research on. And this is an example of one of the search engines linked on our website. This is Peterson's. And the search engines can be particularly helpful to help you decide and rank what factors are important to you in choosing a university. So for an example, we'll use this tool here to look for graduate level schools and programs in a particular field. So in our case, we'll be looking up programs in anthropology in this example. And you'll see here that the search engine pulls up the results of different universities with departments or programs in anthropology. And on the left sidebar here, you can select a variety of factors like location, tuition fees, um, school size to help you narrow down that list further. And once you've narrowed down your choice to about 10 universities of interest, you'll research them further on their university websites and by reaching out to them directly with the ultimate goal of selecting about four to six institutions where you'll actually submit an application. And when you're on these university websites, you can find out more information about their faculty. Some might even list the CVs of their faculty. You can find out their research interests, a list of their publications. They might provide contact information for specific professors to reach out to. Uh, you can find out that they're, if they're still working on something that interests you. 
You can also reach out to current grad students for valuable insight into their experience as a graduate student at a particular university. You can ask students what kinds of projects they're working on, how close the relationships between professors and graduate students are, how close they are with their supervisors, what the campus culture is like, and even more broad questions like, what's the local area like? How to find a good apartment? What's the cost of living? And departments can usually put you in touch by email with a current student. And that can be a good way to help you determine what it's like to study there. So that's an overview of some of the main reasons why you might, why you might want to study in the US and also a guide to the choosing process and how to determine your fit at particular universities and programs. And doing that in-depth research in the choosing process is so important because when you get familiar with the programs that you're looking at, you can really then put together the most competitive application possible for them. And the more competitive your application, the better your chances are at securing funding. So the more time that you spend in the research process, the more benefit it will bring you in the application process. So in this next section, I'm going to bring you through the main components of completing an application. And so let's start out by what universities are looking for with a major caveat and that the detail varies. If you are applying for an MBA, what a university is looking for is going to differ than if you are applying for a program in molecular physics. So it is very much going to differ depending on the program that you're applying for, but there is some basic information that, that's going to be the same across and that you can apply to your particular degree that you're applying for. So first and foremost, US universities are looking for academic achievement. That's gonna be measured by your undergraduate degree and if applicable, your postgraduate degree. So your results from that degree, and then also any admissions test scores if they're required. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Most universities are going to want to see at least a 2-2 on a bachelor's degree, um, although you can contact individual departments or programs about whether your qualifications are sufficient to be considered for admissions. They won't necessarily have strict entry requirements, but they should be able to give you an approximate idea of whether your academic profile is roughly in line with their usual admitted student. Some other things that are going to be important are going to be your reasons for pursuing a postgraduate degree at their institution and how it helps towards your goals, so your academic fit. They're also going to be looking at any kind of relevant work experience or coursework that helps you, that's helped you prepare for this degree. And they'll also look at extracurricular involvement. And this is because U.S. universities want to see a pattern of relevant work and study experience that are laying a strong academic and practical foundation for your studies, as well as your ability and interest in being involved both in and outside of the classroom. U.S. campuses are very lively places, and so they want to see the personality of their applicants coming out. And they may also want to know why you want to study in the U.S. specifically. And there's no standard process for applications that will vary by university and each university will set its own deadlines and application requirements. But with that being said, most applications will follow a similar format and you will be able to reuse or adapt the materials that you prepare for each. So most applications are going to include an application form with your basic information, um, maybe some admissions test scores might be required, which will be sent to the university by the organization that administered the test. And again, we'll talk about that some more in a bit. Uh, they're gonna want to see a transcript, so a listing of your academic marks. Uh, you'll be usually be able to ask for this from your department, university, or registrar's office for, for your transcript, from your, your undergraduate degree or your master's degree, if relevant. They'll also ask for a personal statement that will describe your academic interests, your professional and personal goals, and relevant experience. And that will be an opportunity to put forth any personal history or context and sell yourself to the program. And I'll go into more detail on this in a bit. You'll also provide two to three le letters of recommendation, which I'll talk about some more in a bit. And uh, some might ask for a CV or a resume uh, that will list your professional and extracurricular accomplishments. Some might require an interview. This is especially relevant for MBA programs, we may typically have uh, an interview and occasionally for research degrees too, depending on the program. Depending on what you're applying for, if you're applying for a program in the arts, they might require an audition. Or if you are an art student, you may be asked to submit a portfolio. If you are applying for a research-focused degree, it might be that you're asked to submit a writing sample. So they might ask for some type of submission of work, depending on what type of degree you're applying for. And then finally, 
an application fee of 50 to $100 per application is usually pretty typical. And one thing that you'll want to think about when you're choosing universities to apply to is how your academic profile compares to other applicants. How do universities measure you up as a potential colleague or student? So you'll want to consider your grades, so your UK qualifications. You'll consider your test scores from those admissions exams, if that's something that's required for the programs that you're, take, that you're applying to. You can also think about any research that you've done, and maybe you've done a dissertation as part of your undergraduate degree, thinking about how that would fit in with the institution where you're applying. And you'll also think about work experience. And this is, again, going to be more relevant for some programs than others. So for instance, for an MBA program, it might be that they require some type of work experience. For other programs, it might not be as important. And then you see here, we've mentioned something called the X factor. And what that means is anything that makes you stand out um, to determine where you're going to be likely to be accepted or competitive for funding. So if you're an international student coming from the UK, maybe you've had a really unique undergraduate program and you can make a strong case as to why you'd bring something unique to the program in the US. US universities want to have an interesting mix of ideas and people on their program. So think about if there's anything that, that you're gonna to bring to the table that's unique and figure out how to incorporate that into your application. So to talk a little bit more about admissions tests, the reason, the reason that this even exists in the US is because there's no national curriculum. So admissions exams act as a method of evaluation to help level out the playing fields. And there are a number of different admissions exams. The most common one is the GRE, the graduate record exam. This is used for most master's programs and it measures your verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, critical thinking and analytical writing skills. Um, another common one is the GMAT, which is used for some MBA programs and some business programs. You may have also heard of the LSAT that's used for law J JD programs, um, although it's not used for LLM law programs, which instead require just a first degree in law. There's also the MCAT that's used for um, MD programs and medical admissions. And something to note about all of these different standardized tests is that they tend to be quite different to what you're used to here in the UK. They tend to be multiple choice. They tend to have a strict time limit. And so we do very much recommend that you prepare for them, that you go online and you take practice exams under time conditions. There are a lot of free resources online to help you prepare for these exams. And so it's worth um, spending some time to prepare for them in advance. Now, we're often asked how important these standardized tests are in an admissions decision. And the answer is that it depends. Some universities may not require them at all. And so if you're only applying to universities that don't require them, you don't even need to take them. Um, for others, it might be that they, it factors into their decision, but maybe they're more interested in your personal statement or your transcript. For others, it might be that they're looking at a particular section of the exam. So some might be more interested in your analytical writing and your verbal reasoning scores than how you did on the quantitative reasoning section. It really just depends. Um, you might be able to, to ask the institution how much weight it's going to be given during your research process of choosing where you're going to apply. You'll want to make sure that you take the appropriate test if, if it's required. So first you'll want to confirm that you even need to take a test at all. And if you do, make sure you're taking the right one by consulting the website of each university to which you plan to apply. And you'll want to pay close attention to the university's application deadline and plan your exam schedule accordingly. Make sure that you register early for exams, which leaves you the option to retake the exam if necessary. And as I said, make sure that you do properly prepare for the exam. And then just something to be aware of is that with COVID over the past couple of years, a lot of these exams are, have been trying to make them as accessible as possible. So both the GRE and the GMAT, for instance, have uh, created online versions where you're able to take the GRE at home or the GMAT online exam. So that's something to, to, look work, to look into if you'd prefer to kind of take that exam more flexibly at home than at an actual exam center. <clears throat> and to talk a little bit more about the personal statement, this is one of the most important parts of your application. And it's not like your UCAS personal statements. Um, and it, it is an opportunity to showcase what you can bring to the ta table. It's not an in-depth research proposal, although some universities may ask for a separate research statement to outline your research interests and future plans. Um, instead, 
um, it tends to be an essay about you. It might be an essay of something specific. They might ask you a specific question, <clears throat> but typically it's going to help reveal your character, your motivation, your future goals, and your interest in that particular university program or field. <coughs> Excuse me. Since there's no set structure for writing a personal statement, you do have the opportunity to be creative and make yourself stand out. Some students choose to start with an anecdote describing how they became interested in their field of study. Others use a central theme to link and describe their experiences and future plans for their studies and career. And just to note here, this isn't the time to be modest. It's a, it's a great time to sell yourself as an applicant. And we do have a lot of tips available on our website, including examples of successful personal statements. So I know I personally really like to read through those different examples to help me get a sense of how it differs from something you've written here in the UK. You'll also likely be required to gather two to three letters of recommendation. And you'll want to ask a variety of people who know you well. So the university may provide some loose guidelines for selecting these referees. For example, they might want one letter from an academic reference, another from a professional referee. If you do have multiple academic referees to choose from, you'll want to make sure that you choose someone who knows you well, both in and out of the classroom. And you can also make sure that you're choosing referees that can complement your application package and each other so that you get a good balance of classroom, professional, research, and extracurricular. We recommend meeting with your referee to discuss your letter. Maybe it could be helpful to give them a copy of your application or your transcript or your CV. Tell them the reasons for doing a postgraduate degree in the US in your chosen field. Um, perhaps your interest in the particular universities that you've selected and your future, future goals. And of course, you'll want to make sure that the referee is aware of any deadlines and paperwork to complete. And these letters are used as a marketing tool for you as an applicant. So um, you can direct your referees to mention your ability to succeed at the postgraduate level, observations about your performance, your ability to positively contribute to an institution, maybe some leadership abilities and character, um, as well as your passion for your subject of choice. And you can definitely make suggestions for the contents of the letter, but it's important that you don't see the letter before it gets sent off to the university because this helps maintain the credibility of the letter. Above all, as I mentioned with your personal statement, you'll want to encourage referees to avoid being restrained and too modest. American referees tend to write in an enthusiastic tone using positive and descriptive language to discuss the applicant both in and out of the classroom. So bear in mind what will be written about your American counterparts when preparing your UK, re UK referees to write their letters. So now that I've talked about choosing and um, applying to a US university, I also want to talk about how to fund your studies. And as you might imagine, funding is one of the top things that we get asked about. And a common funding misconception is that the US is always more expensive. But the good news is that there's actually a significant amount of funding available at the postgraduate level, particularly if you're willing to be flexible and go into the process with an open mind. So where is this money exactly? And there's four types of funding for study in the US, with the first, albeit being personal and family funds. So there is a culture in the US of saving and paying for university in a way that we, we don't have in the same way in the loan based system here in the UK. Um, there is really an expectation that you'll make a contribution to your studies. But aside from that, the best resource for funding is likely to be U.S. universities themselves. And there are two most common types of university-based funding at the postgraduate level. The first is fellowships, which are outright grants to allow a recipient to focus solely on their own work. And the second is assistantships, which are offered in return for services provided to the department either teaching, research, lab supervision, or working in a campus office in exchange for a fees waiver, health insurance, and or a stipend. Assistantships tend to be renewable from year to year if the student maintains specified academic standards. Although the terms of the assistantships will vary dramatically between universities and departments, and they'll depend on available grants, the field, and the department need. So that's why it's always important to ask the department or program about this kind of funding when you're choosing where to apply. 
More funding generally tends to be available for PhDs and for students in a research focused master's degree than for a professional degree students. Um, although it also varies by subject area, the sciences tend to receive more funding than programs in the humanities, but this doesn't mean that there isn't funding available in other areas. It just means that it tends to, to be more available in some areas than others. And you might have to look a little bit harder in some of those other areas. You'll want to make sure that you're checking with multiple offices about funding opportunities because they're not always advertised in one central location. So you'll want to check with the department, the graduate school, if, if applicable, and also the financial aid office. So making sure that you're checking in those three different places. Another source of funding is external funding bodies. And these are niche scholarships um, from institutions that are separate to the universities. So for instance, different companies, charities, foundations that might offer funding to complete your degree. And then a final source of funding is going to be loans. We typically only recommend this as a last resort um, or we don't even necessarily recommend it. We, but it's, we say to use it as a last resort. Um, and the reason for this is because in order to get a loan in the US, uh, US lenders are going to require a US citizen to co-sign on the loan. And so most UK citizens would then have to take out private loans from a UK bank in order to go to the US. But we'd really encourage you if you're going to do this to examine the terms and the interest rates closely. So oftentimes the interest rates tend to be very high The and the payback terms tend to, um, they might have you start paying back before you've even completed your degree and started earning, which can be make it very difficult to start paying back a loan. If you are an American or a dual US UK citizen, you can take out a loan from a US lender and you can apply for US federal loans through FAFSA. So as you can see from all of these different options, the university funding and the external funding are definitely the preferred options since they don't include any personal or family funds and they don't have to be paid back like a loan. And you may wish to consider a funding strategy to try and lower costs and manage expenses. So you might think of three different approaches with the first being to reduce the cost of living. So for instance, it's going to be cheaper to live in a rural area than it will be to live in an urban area. So just as here in the UK, it's going to be cheaper um, to live on campus in Lancaster than it is to live on campus by LSE. In the US, it's going to be um, more expensive to live in places you know, like New York City or Los Angeles than it would to be um, in, in more rural areas. You could also look to lower tuition costs. So public universities, which means state-funded universities in the US, generally have lower costs than private universities although private universities might have more funding and funding will vary by department within each university. You could also look for university, uh, university funding. So in addition to the ways that we've already talked about, perhaps you could seek funding outside of your program in an interdisciplinary way. So for example, let's say you are a student who is um, studying architecture, but you have an interest in environmental architecture and making buildings more green. Perhaps you could go to the environmental science department and see if they have any funding to help you fund your architecture degree because of that interdisciplinary nature and that interest of yours. And a word of caution here that you might not necessarily be able to use all three of these strategies in one go, because as I mentioned, you might find that universities with lower tuition might have fewer funding opportunities, but it's important to be aware of the different factors at play and take them into consideration when you're choosing where to apply and doing your research. So just as an example here, um, I've got two different universities here in Boston. Um, Boston University's cost of attendance for their Department of Education and Human, um, within the Department of Education and Human Development is over 79,000 with tuition, room and board and other fees. If you compare that to an MA at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where tuition um, and off-campus finances would be 25,000 less. So it's the same city, but there's a great variance in tuition and fees. So this is where it might be important to be open-minded in your thinking and, and looking for opportunities where you can maybe be in the same city, 
but find uh, universities that have more affordable options. And sometimes close by universities have links and relationships with each other where you might even be able to take, you know, perhaps you could be studying at UMass Boston, but still be able to take some classes at Boston University, depending on the relationships that they have with each other. So now we'll take a little look at a few examples of how to identify funding opportunities. So as I mentioned before, for university funding, the best resource is going to be the university website, checking those three places, the department page, the graduate school page, and the financial aid pages, in case not all the funding opportunities are advertised centrally. See what they say, see if they've got much funding available. Universities will generally try to give you an accurate but conservative measure of how much funding they offer. And if this information isn't available online, it might suggest that they can't offer a lot of financial support, but it is worth getting in touch with the departmental administrator or the director to inquire. You'll also want to think about whether you'll be competitive for funding at that particular institution. You could also ask current students how competitive funding really is and also what their assistantship involves, what the work-life balance is, and kind of get the inside scoop from students. You might want to find out how many assistantships there are available. Are they full or partial? If possible, find out on what basis they award assistantships. Is it your GRE admissions exam score um, factored into this, or is it more on the basis of your other academics or your prior experience? You'll also want to find out if there's any extra requirements that you need to fulfill to be considered for an assistantship. You might be automatically con considered, but in some cases, applicants may need to submit an additional essay or resume. So now we're gonna look at an example of what you can look out for. So this is the website of University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. It's a top public research university in the US. We have highlighted some key points in their section about fellowships and assistantships and how to identify when a university has funding available. So as you can see, um, most universities who are generous with funding will make it quite obvious on their websites. Here in the Department of Political Science, they note that most of the students in their department are supported by fellowships and assistantships with duties typically ranging from 10 to 15 hours per week. And it lists the types of duties that you can expect. It also mentions eligibility for a variety of different fellowships. And oops, and it also notes that Chapel Hill is a highly um, livable college town with a low cost of living. So you can see that two points of the funding strategy exist here, both university funding and the lower cost of living. And then here we have an example of a scholarship from an external funding body, the Fulbright Awards. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the Fulbright Commission is funded by UK and US governments with a mission of promoting mutual understanding through educational exchange. So funding is available for UK students to study and conduct research in the US and vice versa at the postgraduate level. And the number of awards fluctuates each year. Applications are actually open now if you are interested in applying for a Fulbright Award um, with a deadline of the end of May for, for US study beginning in autumn of 2023. So yes, before you may have even applied to your US universities, the, the, the funding is uh, becoming, the application for funding is open now. There are a variety of awards available. Some are for your first year only. There may be other partner awards that are fully funded. So you can check the website for more details. Um, and just something to be aware of with these awards is that the timeline has changed and they're now offering something called the IIE placement model, which provides more generous funding and more support with finding the right university, which is why the timeline is, has changed. So as I said, awards have opened now and they're closing at the end of May. Um, and that's in line with this, this new model that they're offering where they provide you with more support in finding the right university. But that's just one example of an external funding scholarship. And on our website, we have other resources for exploring external funding scholarships. We have online search engines um, that can help you narrow down the thousands of scholarships available based on country, um, of origin, field, et cetera, all different factors that can allow you to find out more information about the eligibility. And then once you use those search engines, you'll want to refer to the specific funding body's website for information about the application process and deadlines. 
So lastly, just some funding tips. So um, as I mentioned earlier, applying for funding often happens simultaneous to the admissions process. So you'll want to begin the search for funding early. And if funding is important to you, it's going to be important that you're willing to put in the time and effort to seek out and apply for funding opportunities. Typically scholarships will not find you, unfortunately. You'll need to investigate university funding and take the time to search for the often niche external scholarships. And you'll want to be flexible in choosing universities. If it's essential for you to receive funding to complete postgraduate study, you'll want to choose departments with a lot of funding or where you're competitive or a top student. And sometimes you'll even be able to see the exam scores um, or grades of last year's admitted students on the university websites. And as I mentioned earlier, the best resource um, to find university funding is the university website itself. Checking those three different places, the department page, the graduate school page if it exists, and the financial aid page. Checking all three in case not all funding opportunities are advertised centrally. Another thing that's just worth keeping in mind is that you can typically work on campus up to 20 hours per week during term time and 40 hours per week during holidays. Although these expected earnings can't be calculated for visa purposes when you're showing your proof of funds. So all of these are different things to keep in mind with that, as you can see here, being flexible and choosing your universities is really the top tip, especially as a student coming from the UK, you'll want to think about are you applying to institutions where they're going to have lots of other students applying from the UK? Or are you applying to an institution where maybe you're going to be the only students um, applying for the UK from the UK? And that can really be that X factor, that factor that helps you stand out. So now I'd like to talk about some additional ways that we can help. And first and foremost, if you haven't already, I highly recommend that you visit our website for advice um, and also for guides and events. Under this going to the USA section, we have a postgraduate guide that goes through the, all the details of choosing funding and applying. So I know that I've talked you through it over the course of this webinar, but it's all written down on the website and it goes into much more detail and it's all there for you. So I do highly recommend that you go and take a closer look at all of that information. On the website under here, you'll also find the Fulbright Award section where you can find more details about the Fulbright Awards, their categories, their benefits, the selection criteria, and also the application procedures. We also offer advice if you need any more help as you go through the process. So you can book a one-to-one -one video appointment with an advisor, or you can email us at advisingfulbright.org.uk. Um, and I will caution you with this, is that we here um, on my team, with, on the Education USA team, we can provide advice and information on the process of choosing a university, funding your studies, and going through that application process. If you have really specific questions about the Fulbright Awards and applying for funding at, from a Fulbright Award, you'll want to reach out to my colleagues that are on that team. And that email address was on the screen a few slides earlier, and that was programs at fulbright.org.uk. Um, I will not be best placed to answer those questions. You'll want to reach out to that specific team that, that manages those awards. We also offer events about studying in the US, both online and in person. So you can visit our website to see what events we have coming up and see if there's anything that might be interesting and relevant to you. And then that brings us to the end. Um, so as I said, this, this has been recorded. So if you're not able to stay for the Q&A section of this session, um, thank you for attending. If you are able to stay and you have any questions, feel free to put some questions in the Q&A box now and I will answer as many questions as I can. Um, and I will also just put in the chat um, the email addresses that I mentioned as well. And I, as I said, the best questions to ask me are questions about the choosing process, the application process and funding. If you have any specific questions that are about the Fulbright Award specifically and applying for any of that funding from a Fulbright Award, you'll want to reach out to the Fulbright Award team. So I'll put both those email addresses here. So for Fulbright Awards, questions. 
their email is programs at fulbright.org.uk. Um, for general advice on choosing, funding, and applying, you can reach out to us at advising at fulbright.org.uk. So, um, the other thing that I should note too, is that I do ask that you keep your questions as, as general as possible, questions that would be relevant to the whole group. If you do have anything that's very specific to your circumstances, it'd probably be best for you to reach out to us by email or signing up for a video call. So one question is, how likely is it for students to get funding that covers 100% of fees? And the answer to that is that it really does depend. Um, I, I can't give you like a percentage of how likely it is. I know that it is possible. Um, but again, that comes down to how flexible that you're willing to be and how much time and energy you're willing to put into the process. That the more flexible you are and the more time and energy that you put into the process, the more likely you are to, to be successful with that. Um, but if you have your heart set on, you know, one or two particular organization um, institutions, then it does kind of narrow those options, if that makes sense. Um, somebody is asking about the types of references that are required, whether it's better to include um, three academic references or perhaps two academic and one professional reference. And again, this is going to depend specifically on the program where you're applying. And so what I would recommend is taking a look at the specific requirements for the program, making sure that you're meeting those requirements. Um, and if there is any kind of flex flexibility and it is giving you that kind of option, then I would say that you want to think about how you want your picture to be painted. So if, you know, if there are certain referees that can talk to different aspects of your personality, you might be wanting to choose you know, a variety of two to three different people that are going to speak to different parts of you. You know that this person is going to be able to talk about the, your strength in the classroom or, or the really great research that you've done as a student. There might be that there's somebody else where you've had good work experience and they're able to talk about that work experience. Or maybe you've been really involved in an extracurricular and somebody has overseen that extracurricular and can talk about that experience. So trying to get that variety so that the person in the US that's reading that application can really get a full sense of you, um, as opposed to maybe two people who are writing the exact same thing about you, if that makes sense. Um, somebody who's asking about entry into 2022-23, uh, so starting maybe this autumn or this spring, um, and whether it's still possible. And so I would say it's, it's potentially still possible. A lot of deadlines will have passed and a lot of funding um, may no longer be available. So if you're looking for funding, I would say that it, it would be really tricky at this stage. But if, if you're not as dependent on funding, there, there might be some possibilities open, especially if you were maybe to look into do like a spring start. So maybe starting in January of 2023, those deadlines might see, still be available. It's really a matter of kind of starting to do some research. So maybe going to some of those search engines available on our website and finding some institutions that offer the type of degree that you're looking for and just starting to do like a quick preliminary search of deadlines and trying to get a sense, seeing if there, there are any that might still be open and available for this upcoming year. Um, I think a lot of deadlines will have passed, but I would imagine that there are some programs that maybe haven't filled up that maybe have more of a rolling deadline basis and they continue accepting applications until they're filled and so it's worth checking um a question on narrowing down your academic fit to a particular university coming from the uk there's lots of top us universities that are not very well known in the uk um so that's true yes so there there are i always say this especially when you're talking about 1,700 universities offering postgraduate degrees and what you know the top 1% of that is compared to the top 1% of the 120 universities here in 
the uh, UK, you probably you know can't even name that many institutions in the US. And so it is important to make sure that you're widening your search. In terms of narrowing, I'm trying to make sure that I'm understanding the question accurately. Um, in terms of the top US universities that are not very well known in the UK, I will say that while we do encourage students in the UK to take rankings from the US with a grain of salt, because they're not typically, mm, the rankings don't work the same way in the US as they do in the UK. Sometimes rankings come from like peer reviews um, or universities ranking each other. And so it's not necessarily as formulaic as it is here in the UK, but um, they can be slightly more helpful at the graduate level where you are looking for institutions that are particularly well known in a field. And so using some of those search engines that are available on our website can give you, at least in terms of the rankings, can give you an idea of universities to start researching that maybe you've never heard of before. You might see some names at the top that you are very familiar with, but there's also going to be other universities in those top numbers that maybe you've never heard of before that are worth looking into further. Um, so I would say that while taking rankings with a grain of salt, you can also use it as a tool to identify universities that maybe you've never heard of before and to conduct more research on. I hope that that's useful. Um, also in terms of narrowing down your academic fit, I think again, thinking about what's important to you in, you know, in what types of opportunities are available to you within that particular program, because the programs are gonna vary so differently. You know, are you looking for internship opportunities? Are you looking for research opportunities? Are you looking to be able to attend conferences? Are you looking to get teaching experience? Um, is the program going to be interdisciplinary or is it more tightly focused? You know, wh what are you looking for exactly in a program and kind of really doing your research on those programs to kind of think about what would you would be happiest um, in terms of doing the degree and coming out of that degree with that experience. And then we also have a question from somebody who is attending from another country that is not the, the UK. Um, and so, so welcome. I would say that our information can be helpful to you in terms of what the process is for choosing a university and funding your studies and the application process. You may also wish to find the Education USA Center that is in your country as well. Um, so if you, if you go to the Education USA website, you'll be able to find the particular organization for your country, and you'll be able to find advisors within your country that will be familiar with how the academic system in your country works, and they can help best advise you on how to apply to the US as a student from your country. So it looks like those are all of the questions that we've had come through so far. If you think of any other questions after we've finished, you are welcome to email us at advising at fulbright.org.uk, or you can go ahead and sign up for one of those video appointments with an advisor. And I want to thank you all for tuning in this evening, and I hope that you found the information useful, and um, best of luck to you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye.